Alrighty, we're gonna get started. All right. So, welcome to our second micro mouse lecture um, this year. So today we're going to be talking about motors and encoders. So we're going to go do a quick overview of some types of motors that you could use, as well as um, which motors we're going to be using for MicroMouse. We're also going to talk about how to control motors, both the direction that they spin and how fast they spin, so their power level. And then we're also going to talk about encoders, which is actually how we measure how far a motor has spun. And we can use this to control our motors precisely. So this is just a little sort of visual overview of what we're going to talk about today and how it all fits together. We're going to talk about all these things in detail going forward, but this is just kind of a little preview. So our microcontroller on our rat, that's what we're using to control everything. Uh, in particular, we send a signal to our motor driver, our H-bridge, and from that, um, that sends a signal to our motors, which our motors turn on then, and they'll spin. As they spin, that spin is measured by our encoders, which sends that information back to the microcontroller. So as I said, we're going to be talking about all these things in details, but this is how our sort of motor control system is going to work at a high level. All right, so uh, now we're going to talk about a little bit about the motors that we have on our RAT. Um, so first of all, I'm going to talk about uh, types of motors. We have brushed and brushless motors here. Um, so these are the two major like kinds of motors that you would see in a lot of applications nowadays. Um, and the biggest difference, as is probably apparent by the naming, is uh, one has brushes that actually physically contacts the spinning rotor, and the other one doesn't, where uh, it just spins in the middle, um, controlled by three moving, uh, three sorry, static uh, electromagnets. Um, so one, one of the like big uh, advantages of these brushless motors is just that they're a lot more efficient because they don't have the friction of those brushes. They're more durable because those brushes wear out. Um, and you know, they're, they're better for high precision applications, uh, like because you can measure them a little bit better uh, and have greater control over your motor. Um, the biggest downside of these though is that they're, they're pretty expensive um, and they're hard, to, they're hard to control. As you can see, there's actually three um, wires going into this one. So they're, they're all special, um, and they're more effort than these brush motors that I'm about to talk about. Um, but places where you'd see brush motors would include like, uh, you know, drones use uh, brushless motors. Sorry, I said brushed earlier. Uh, they, drones use brushless motors, uh, you know, sometimes vacuums advertise brushless on the side or something, you know, uh, to imply that they're better. Um, and the brushless motors are just, you know, seen in a wide variety of applications. Uh, and then we have brushed motors for the other type we have here, um, of course, they're much easier to control because, as you can see, there's only two inputs there. These actually, you just give a DC voltage, whereas these brushless motors, you have to give uh, three-phase AC. Um, but because of that DC input, that means that they're super easy to control because you can just give it, it goes faster when you, when you give more voltage, and it goes slower when you give it less voltage. Simple, simple. Um, they're also super cheap, uh, a lot cheaper than these. So for those reasons, we're using brushed motors for our RET instead of brushless. And uh, so yeah, here's the exact motors that we're going to be using. This is a nice big picture of something that's about this big. Um, but anyways, uh, so these motors, have, as I said before, are brushed. Uh, you don't see them, but they are back here inside this uh, uh, black plastic cap. Um, they also, the big feature is that they have a 30 to 1 gear ratio. Does anyone uh, in here know like, why we would want that on the front of our motor? Can raise your hand or something or shout out. Yeah, what's up? Speed. Speed. Yeah, sort of. Uh, so, so thirty to one here actually means that for every thirty rotations that our main motor like spins, our uh, output is only going to spin one time. So that could in that would actually decrease our speed. But uh, one of the things that we get from that because we decrease our speed, we actually increase our torque output. Which basically means that um, our, our rat, you know, can can go a little slower than these motors because uh, essentially, if you like pinch them, the, there's not a lot of torque, so they will stop even at full power if you just pinch them. So we don't want that. We want our rat to be able to, you know, go over like small bumps in our maze or something. So we have a 30 to 1 gear ratio here to give it a little more torque, um, so that our rat doesn't go infinite speed either because these do spin at like 3,000 RPM. Or actually, I don't know the number, but. They, they spin pretty quick uh, regardless. 
So uh, we need the gear ratio there, um, the gearbox, to bring that down to something more usable. The other figure here that we have that's really useful is our 6 volts ideal operating voltage. That just tells us that this motor is designed to work at 6 volts. Um, and below that, it'll go slower nominally. And above that, it'll go faster. And if you go too far above, then it may burn out. Our rats, as uh, you might have seen in lecture one, we said that our battery voltage is 7.4 volts. Um, so that's a little bit above what these, th what these normally use. But we're never going to be going full speed. And if you are, then that's really impressive. <laughs> um, anyways. Uh, so that tells us, uh, you know, that we're matching our battery voltage and our and our motor voltage so that uh, everything lines up properly. The last important figure here is our max current draw of 0.67 amps. That will come in more important later when we talk about motor control. And we see that uh, in order to control our motor, we have to be able to uh, control that much current draw. Otherwise, we'd have uh, we'd have our uh, controller burning up before our motor actually maxes out. So if it gets stuck, then you might burn something rather than it just you know struggling and heating up a little bit. Um, but anyways, those are the motors that we use on our RAT. So that's it about for motors. Does anyone have any questions about that? Anything we went over? All right, great. Motors are pretty easy. Oh, let's quit it. No, oh, you're good. You're good. All right. Also, as going forward, feel free to uh, raise your hand at any point. Um, we are here to a um, answer your questions. and. Um, it's usually better to clarify something while we're talking about it rather than after. Uh, but yeah, we'll have breaking points like this, but feel free to raise your hand anytime. So uh, without further ado, we're going to talk about motor control. So we have motors, but how are we going to actually use them? Um, you might think we can hook it up directly to a microcontroller pin, but this actually will not work because, um, for one, uh, the microcontroller only operates at 3.3 volts, and that is not enough. We saw on a previous slide that it only work that you need at least six volts for it to work fully. Um, the other problem with it is it can't draw enough current from the microcontroller in order to power the motor. And also, if we were to really hook it up like directly to a pin, that's not gonna. Uh, that's not going to work because we can't control which direction the motor is going, we can't control how fast, so we need ways to do that. And that's what's going to fall under this concept of motor control. So the first thing that we're going to use to enable this is a transistor. So we, the idea here is, as we see in this little schematic on the side, we want to actually be able to use our battery voltage to power our motor. We can't just do it directly or else it'll just be on all the time. So we need to use a transistor as a switch. So we can basically hook our microcontroller pin to the transistor. So the transistor, when you apply a voltage to the base, that will allow current to flow from the collector to the emitter. So that basically acts as a switch. So if we turn on B, uh, current can flow. So well, this is what our circuit will end up looking like. We can, depending on whether our pin is on and off, that will allow current to flow from the battery to ground, so that basically allows us to turn our motor on and off using the battery voltage and not the voltage from the pin. So that solves our first problem of having enough voltage, but we still have a few issues here. So, and those issues are going to be resolved using a flyback diode. So when we have motors, uh, when they're turning, they basically have electromagnets in them and that's going to act as a magnet. And so you may know that anytime you have a magnetic field, that's going to, you're going to have some inductance. And so when you're turning your motor on and off, that can become a problem. In fact, when you turn your motor off, you're going to have a back EMF or a temporary voltage spike that could go and flat fry your transistor. So that's not good. So what we need is a diode, which is going to allow current to flow in one direction. And so where we put it is right here, so that when we turn our motor off and we get that spike in voltage, any current is going to go and flow back up to our batteries as opposed to going down to and down and uh, frying our transistor. But since it is a diode, it can't flow downwards normally, so it's not like we have a short circuit here. So that, that flyback diode is going to allow us to actually use this without um, those voltage spikes doing damage. And uh, now we'll see what happens when you take that system and we just uh, multiply it times a bunch. 
So here's uh, essentially what we call an H bridge, because it looks kind of like an H here. Um, but essentially, it's, it's we take that, we have four transistors here and four flyback diodes. And um, what we see happens here is when we turn on just uh, the top and the uh, the top left and the bottom right ones, here we call them Q1 and Q4, we see that mo uh, current flows from the motor to the right side, so it's going to flow through um, and spin the motor in one direction. Whereas if we uh, take this and we turn on Q3 and Q2 here, we'll see that the path becomes something like this, and our motor starts spinning the other direction. Isn't that fancy? Um, <laughs> And so, so that makes uh, that's why we have an H bridge here. So you see this this fancy thing. Um, so that's how we're going to control our motors so that we can go both forward and backward, uh, no problem. Um, now, one thing is here with this H bridge, the way this is designed, there is one uh, problem that you could run into. So what would happen if we say turned on Q3 and Q4? Does anyone see what would happen here? Sure. Yeah, we're going to have a short right here, and our power is going to go straight down from VCC to ground and uh, fry something, probably your H bridge. Uh, it's going to short through those transistors and cause issues. So in our program, we have to make sure never to turn on uh, these, these two or these two at the same time. But luckily, our hardware makes that pretty easy. And actually, our code templates will uh, ensure that you, there's not as much of a risk of doing that. But do know that that's a way you can insta fry your little H bridge on your RAT. Um, so yeah, so this is one motor, and then the H bridge ICs on our rat, we actually have two motors, right? So what we do is something called a dual H bridge. It's two of them. So now we can control two motors. Uh, here's just a diagram of a uh, larger SMD H bridge, and uh, this one's just a schematic of how you might use that H bridge. Um, but essentially, yeah, controls two motors. Uh, we have four inputs and four outputs. And you might ask, okay, that's weird. We saw four transistors on the side. Wouldn't that be four inputs? So we have eight, right? Uh, but no, so actually each input is tied into uh, each of these two transistors. So um, input one will turn on both Q1 and Q4 so that, uh, so that you only have to you know, control one at a time. Um, now do note this still uh, doesn't prevent you from turning on like input one and input two and then still causing a short of, through all four. Um, but you know, uh, yeah. And then we also, just a note here on our uh, H bridge, we have enable pins uh, in the top left and in the bottom right. And uh, those essentially just enable or disable this IC. This is a feature of our specific H bridge that we might not be using. So we just tie them uh, here to 3.3 volts or high so that our motors are always on and responding to whatever input we give them. Um, however, like if you wanted to turn yours off in like your in your mouse PCB or something, like have a switch for them, you could disable that enable pin, um, and that would turn off your motors and disable the H bridge. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Oh, the other thing we have here is our decoupling capacitors. You might see in the schematic here. Um, essentially, what these are for is is like a little low pass filter to reduce noise on our power lines, and that's a good thing because. Um, we are interfacing with the 3V3 and the uh, battery voltage just through this one uh, H bridge. So what's going to happen is that, uh, you know, again, when we turn the motors on and off, it's going to, uh, you know, cause spikes or whatever in the voltage. And in order to mitigate that from getting to our uh, controls or our microcontroller and this H bridge and, you know, our IR sensors and everything, uh, we put these decoupling capacitors here to prevent that. Yeah. All right, uh, and here's a couple pictures of what each bridge I sees might look like. Here's a fantastic 3D model of um, your rat that you guys are going to get in your kits, uh, hopefully very soon. And then here's just a picture of Dominic's actually his uh, his breakout PCB that he designed last year and uh, implemented on his own breadboard rat. Um, so this one's actually an SMD component. It has a couple more pins because it's a different model, but um, he's mounting it on top instead of a through hole thing. Um, and then the one other notable thing here is that uh, the H bridge on our rat is actually socketed. So if you do pop it and uh, fry it, then um, you can replace it, which hopefully you guys won't have to do. But it is a thing that we have um, just in case. So yeah, there they are in the circles. Cool. So we've already talked about using an H bridge, which we can use to turn on our motors and turn them in different directions. But we haven't talked about yet is how to make our motors move different speeds. So the way we're going to accomplish that is by using, by using something called 
PWM or pulse width modulation. So you may have mixed paint in your life if you want, but what if you imagine you want gray paint and you have white paint and black paint. So are, are you, is it possible to make gray? Well, of course, you have to mix some white and some gray paint. That, so, or some black and some white paint to make a gray paint. So that's essentially what we have going on here with. Sorry. All good. That's essentially what we have going on here with um, PWM. So our microcontroller pins can only turn on and off. That's our black and white paint. But we can create a range of colors or a range of voltages by mixing our on and off signals, by turning our pin on and off rapidly to sort of simulate um, a, a place in between our maximum and minimum voltage. So the duty cycle is the percent of time that we actually are in the on state versus the off state. So the higher the duty cycle, the higher the perceived voltage will be. And our frequency is the amount of changes per second of on and off, on and off. So that's our cycles. So this is actually what our signals will look like in PWM. So if you have a 50% duty cycle, we're on half the time, off half the time. And so that'll average out to be like right in the middle like that. So that would be running our motors at half speed. Uh, say we wanted to go a little faster and we were on 75% of the time, off 25% of the time, then it would, uh, it would average out to be something a little bit more like this. So our motors are running faster because our microcontroller pin is on more of the time. And then 25% of the time, uh, or 25% duty cycle, you have a similar phenomenon here. It's going to be running our motors slow, a little bit slower, because uh, the motor, or because the microcontroller is off, the pin is off for more of the time than it is on, but it's still on a little bit. So um, motors, and you might think that it, it's not super good to have it turning on and off all the time, right? Because that could be jerky. But as it turns out, motors, you know. They react slowly to these changes because they are physically moving, and they also do they also do act as inductors. So it is going to end up looking pretty smooth. So we don't have to worry about that, and so we can use PWM to control motors. Um, okay, all right. So now uh, we've talked about this, but how are we actually going to do this on the microcontroller? So the way we're going to use it is by using timers, which we have on our microcontroller. Our microcontroller's clock has a speed of 16 megahertz, and our H bridge has a max frequency of 5 kilohertz for PWM. So by doing a little bit of division, um, that we can actually have our clock cycle be 3200. So that means that in 3200 clock cycles, um, we can actually have if we're on for 1600 and then off for 1600, that corresponds to a 50% duty cycle. Um, and so 3200, that's essentially our frequency. Well, it's, our, it's actually our period, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that was the example I just gave. All right, so uh, again, we'll, we'll pause again for questions. Pretty soon we're going to talk about encoders. But f first of all, does anyone have any questions about Motor control, each bridges, PWM, any of the stuff that we have just discussed. Or anything else? What's that? Like, why do we bother with manipulating the speed of the motor if the micromass's goal is to like, just like get through the maze? Is there like a time restriction as well? Or? Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the goal of micromass, uh, you'll see in the competitions, is to go through the maze, uh, one, to get to the end, and then two, to do it as fast as possible. So the other thing is, if you, we only had the, gr the granular control of on or off, these rats actually move pretty fast. So you'd, you'd be like speeding through the maze um, and not having, you know, you'd, you'd probably like run into walls because you wouldn't have enough time to like actually stop and skid or whatever. Um, so we, we need PWM here in order to smoothly start and stop and move properly um, without just, you know, on or off. Because frankly, they do really go fast. So uh, yeah. Any other questions? Nope. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Um, now we can talk about encoders. So as we talked about before, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, encoders are what measure our position of our motors, so we can figure out how far we've gone. So uh, one of the things is they they just in 
measure the rotation of our motor and um, they measure like how far a rat can actually travel. Because if you see uh, in our picture there, uh, you can see that they're actually mounted to the back of the motor. So every time the motor does a revolution, uh, it'll measure that revolution and be like, okay, we know we've gone this far. So uh, our rat knows exactly how far we travel rather than saying, oh, our motor was on for X time, which is not very good because um, some of our motors are slightly different. So you might go slightly different distances if you turn a motor on uh, for a speci specified amount of time rather than going a certain amount of distance. Um, and then the other thing, yeah, we can, we can measure like how fast the rat is actually moving and, uh, you know, counting. <laughs> uh, I didn't read this beforehand, it's okay. Um, but yeah, so yeah, we, we, it simply just uh, counts the number of like cycles or like uh, divisions that uh, we measure. Um, and there's two different kinds of encoders. We have magnetic encoders and optical encoders, as you can see in those two pictures. One of which where you like uh, have a wheel that has a, a photo sensor where the light gets cut on and off. So the sensor will essentially count one, two, three, four like uh, times when the motor, when the, uh, sorry, the uh, code wheel goes around and it'll flash on the uh, sensor so you can count that. Whereas instead with a magnetic disc, you're counting how many times does the, uh, the magnetic field switch sides. So yeah, let's see, magnetic. Magnetic encoders are the ones that we're gonna use. These are kind of what ours look like. Uh, yeah, so essentially they just sense the change in the position as the motor spins. Um, and these uh, magnetic disks here are actually six poles, so they have about 60 degrees between each pole, uh, as you can see kind of like this, and so not uh, alternating. Um, and then they also have two Hall effect sensors, you can see right here, where they're mounted at 90 degrees from each other. And that essentially, uh, yeah. So we can measure the uh, volt, uh, the, you can measure the, um, the change in the magnetic field using these Hall effect sensors, which Hall effect is defined here as, uh, you know, the, um, basically, it creates voltage uh, when our um, magnetic field shifts from side to side. Um, yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about how magnetic encoders work. So uh, we've already established that our magnetic poles are 60 degrees apart, and our Hall effect sensors are 90 degrees apart. So what does this mean? This actually means that we have an encoder count every 30 degrees. Are you convinced? I'm not convinced. We need to take a look at this. Um, so, when I, so let's say we start at zero degrees. Um, our first sensor sees a north, and our second sensor is in between, so it doesn't see anything. So then if we spin our motor another 30 degrees, our first sensor doesn't see anything. Our second sensor sees a south. Keep spinning. We see a south and nothing then nothing and north, and then finally, again, we see north and nothing. So basically, we sort of have these four distinct states, we all within 120 degrees of rotation. Um, so that means that every 30 degrees, we can actually detect a change. And so that change is going to be one encoder count. So we know we've moved a certain amount. Um, and so the same thing applies counterclockwise. Uh, where we see, but uh, you'll notice here that the order that we see these patterns of north and south is different. So say we start at north, um, then our second sensor is going to see north, then our, f our first sensor is going to see south, then our second sensor is going to see south, and then finally our first sensor is going to see north again. So it's the same patterns, but they're in different directions. So we can actually tell which direction our motor has spun. Uh, which is going to be really important because that'll um, because knowing which direction our motor is spinning is going to allow us to control it better. So, not only uh, every thirty degrees can we do we know that that's how far it's traveled, we also can tell which direction we're going. Uh, so let's take a little bit to think about how precise our encoders. So, th thirty degrees every motor rotation doesn't sound like very much or it sounds, doesn't sound very precise. But remember, we're counting every 30 degrees, but that, um, so that means that every, in the <coughs> 360 degree rotation, we have 12 counts as the motor is spinning. Uh, what's going on here? Um, and so we have also have this 31 gear ratio, so we multiply that out. It means we're actually gonna be c have 
360 counts per wheel rotation. Um, and then our wheel dimension is about 3.2 centimeters, so about 10 centimeters of circumference. Oh. And then we just do a little bit of math and divide the 360 by 10 centimeters. Basically means that we have 36 counts per centimeter. So that's sort of just a little bit of an estimate of how precise encoders are. So it means every centimeter our rat travels, we can know that there's like, we can divide that into 36 little counts. So we can actually, a 36th of a centimeter, we can discern how far that travels. Of course, that's not gonna be exact because our motors or our wheels can skid a little bit. Um, so it's not 100% precise, but that gives us a sense of how useful encoders are gonna be because we'll know exactly how far we've traveled. All right, so. Tim's going to talk a little bit about how to. Do uh, this. Yeah, so using encoders with our MCU is, uh, you know, it sounds really complicated, but uh, because of what you just saw and how they work, but really it's 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 uh, pretty simple because we just use timers yet again. Um, so essentially, these timers, instead of counting up based on time, we use them as counters to keep track of our rotation. And there's something really cool. We uh, use our Hall effect sensors and we put them into our pins, and we get two timer channels. And then what happens is we use encoder mode on those two timer channels. And that was essentially interpret the signal for us, so we do, so that the microcontroller does all the work. Um, we don't have to, you know, figure out the this one went north, south, or whatever. Like um, uh, the encoder mode is made for these things because they know that uh, a ton of people use them, so it interprets the signals for us and gives us a nice uh, oh positive encoder counts when we go forward, negative when we go backwards. Um, so that's super easy to use. And then uh, let's go back to this overview. Um, to you know, see exactly what we were doing. So as we saw before, we from our microcontroller, it sends a PWM signal to our H-Bridge motor driver here. Um, and then that turns the motors on and off uh, like uh, a million times per second or, um, or at a certain duty cycle in order to activate our motors and give it an average voltage that is uh, proportional to how fast our motors are spinning. So based on that speed, uh, our motors are going to turn, and that's going to cause feedback in the encoders. It's going to measure the uh, magnetic field changing on those disks and create pulses that our microcontroller reads back. And that way, we get feedback based on our uh, output, which is super important for later. Um, but for now, that's about it for today, because I know that's a lot of information, pretty dense. Uh, but does anyone have any questions over anything that we went over? We'll go over a little bit of logistical stuff in like three seconds, so questions about that can stay. But anything about the uh, subject matter right hand? Great. Yeah, what's up? Just a general question about the magnetic encoders you're talking mm -hmm. about. So are they electromagnets? The uh, disks are like, um, they're permanent magnets. So the Hall effect sensors, I don't know exactly how they work, but essentially they, they just create a pulse. Um, given 3.3 volts, they just give a one or a zero based on um, where, on, on which direction the uh, uh, magnetic field is pointing. And actually, if you look, uh, let's, I don't know, I can't go back, can you go back? Yeah, yeah. Um, back to where it was, yeah, uh, something like this. You can see that the uh, Hall effect sensors are, are aligned like Right, uh, they're they're aligned very specifically so that um, it lines up with how they um, how they respond. So these are just permanent magnets waving over the sensors, and that is enough to give us a feedback signal. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Does that make sense? Uh, cool. What light light encoders do you better to use instead of those magnetic? Because like uh, let's say if your rat crashes into a wall. Mm -hmm. It's possible that these magnets may lose their magnetism. There are permanent magnets, and uh, I, I don't know the specifics of, of like the magnetism, but since they're permanent magnets, they're you know good, and they're they get jostled around, and they're gonna keep keep their uh, magnetism, um, and they're not like waving by any other magnets either. So there's no reason they would lose their magnetism. So these are pretty accurate. Um, yeah. The light sensors are a lot harder to implement, and. Uh, uh, and, and you know you need a lot more complex electronics to, to do that um, so that's why we use the magnetic ones yeah so there are some advantages and disadvantages to magnetic versus optical encoders but one thing is uh, so it's interesting that you brought the, up that effect with magnetic encoders but it's actually you're more likely to have interference with optical encoders because you it has to actually travel through the air 
you've got light through the air. So if that gets messed up, or if there's like particles in the air, you could have some problems there. Whereas magnets, like our Hall effect sensors, are always going to change or uh, to detect changes in magnetic fields. So unless you're like running this in a very weird magnetic environment, uh, right. magnetic MRI. sensors are going to be <laughs> yeah, <laughs> our our yeah our <laughs> magnetic Hall effect sensors are going to do just fine for our purposes. Okay. Um, are those are those like decoders uh, soldered onto the motors? Or yeah, they are. Um, yeah, we we soldered them on for you guys because they're designed pretty poorly, uh, so they're like pretty tricky to solder. Um, so we'll get them to you with the encoders on them already. Yeah. Right. Cool. Speaking of soldering, shall we talk about uh, some logistical things? Eventually, when you click all the way through, there we go. Assignment 2.1. I know, no one has started assignment 1.1 yet, because actually I haven't looked. But you guys can't, couldn't have finished it by now. But uh, we'll talk more about assignment 1.1 in a second. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you guys, don't worry, you guys have time. You guys got time. I know we said the due date was Friday. It's actually next Friday. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but anyways, assignment 2.1. So we're going to be uh, soldering our motor control circuit, so everything that you just saw in our uh, diagrams and everything, you're going to be soldering onto your rat, and then that will be making your, oh yeah, you're going to make the schematic that goes along with that, so something similar to the schematic that you saw here, you're going to implement it all, and then you're going to write some code to make your motors and encoders work, and wow, your uh, rat's going to get to move for the first time. I know you guys haven't even seen your rats yet, you'll get them soon. Um, but this will be due the week, uh, like two weeks away, which should be plenty of time. Um, yeah, so that's all for assignment 2.1, and I know you guys want information about assignment 1.1. Yeah, we do. It's, yeah. it's just later. Okay. Anyway, a okay. couple things. Some of you guys haven't done your safety, and you haven't done your deposit, and you haven't done your piazza. Please do it. Um, it's not that many of you, but you know who you are. Um, yeah, anyway, just if you need help, let me yeah. know. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Deadline for those is it's gonna be Friday, this Friday, midnight. If you don't do it by then, uh, like we've already sent you guys emails and everything if you haven't done like the safety stuff yet. So this Friday, midnight, hard deadline. If you don't do safety, deposit, and piazza, you guys are getting dropped. Uh, so yeah, but hopefully all you guys have done that, which a lot of you have, so you're good. Um, and then next on the list, we have our work session. So we know that there's been some uh, we haven't like gotten you guys kits yet and there's been a little uncertainty without this all working but we're gonna have a work session on Sunday afternoon so you guys can come into the lab ask for help uh, get yeah just ha or just have some dedicated work time if you don't have to have specific questions just come into the lab get a little bit of work on MicroMust done and get that you can either work on finishing up assignment 1.1 you can also work on assignment 2.1 if you are ahead of schedule um, so yeah go ahead and come in and in addition to this, uh, feel free to come in during our lab hours. We had lab hours today, um, and there were some people that came in to ask questions. That was uh, really helpful. Uh, we have some more lab hours this week, as well as you can come in really to the lab anytime, because uh, we're here in the lab even when we don't have official lab hours sometimes, as well as other officers. So please come in and ask for help uh, if, you ha if you have questions or just uh, come and work and you'll need to do that when you uh, have soldering. You guys know how to get to the lab, right? We're good? Raise your hand if you don't know how to get to the lab. You never been there? Ever been there? All right. Well, right. At the, actually at the end of this, we'll, we'll, we'll walk we'll you to the lab like three seconds because we'll show you where your so kits are. We'll show you. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then another thing, soldering workshop. They've been moving <coughs> around. Dates have been hard because we're in person again and everyone forgets that people have things, and do, things to do and places to be. Um, so yes, it's moved uh, to this Thursday, right? That is this Thursday or is it next Thursday? That's next Thursday. That is next Thursday. Not this Thursday. It was this Thursday. Now it is going to be next Thursday. From 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Fall through second floor. What's up? Online for shared calendar. Sorry, because it says it's the 27th. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's they don't know what they're doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was going to be the 27th. It is the 28th, okay. I think. I, yeah. I asked Sadat yeah, literally this morning, so yeah, sorry about the confusion with the soldering yeah. workshop. It For those of you that perfect. don't have soldering experience though, and don't, and I don't, wouldn't probably not recommend you wait until going to this, um, come to the work session to get help with soldering. 
go ahead and come to lab hours. Uh, we're here to help you. Um, so we, we don't want that to be a problem. And we'll be lenient with the, with the assignment as needed uh, based on that, because we know that this has kind of been a little bit confusing with all these dates changing and stuff. Yeah. So um, as for soldering, know that anytime you guys go into the lab, it's open from uh, what 10 to 6 p.m. 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. You can come in. Uh, there will be an officer in there. So if the only thing you got to get done is the soldering part, they will know how to teach you how to solder. At least they better. <laughs> so they will. Um, so if, if that's what's uh, stopping you from finishing this assignment, uh, don't hesitate to you know come in during lab hours and get some help. Yeah. And then next thing. Yes, uh, as I said before, assignment 1.1 .1 is due next Friday, not this Friday, thankfully, because we haven't gotten you your kits yet. Speaking of kits, um, we had some trouble with some parts. We're going to do some hacky <coughs> stuff to get them to you. Um, that will be done hopefully by tomorrow. So you guys should be able to come in once you've done your safety deposit and joining the piazza you will be able to come in and get your kits uh, and we'll check you off. You guys have to have your entire team has to be, not there, but your entire team has to be checked off for all of those three. Um, let me know if you haven't talked to your team members yet because I know we haven't had a social for that. That's in the works. Um, anyways, yeah, so we'll get those to you uh, either you know, in the next couple days or if you can't get it by then, uh, like we'll have our lab hours and you'll just have to speed solder. Um, I, I think it's fine. People can come in and, yeah. and use the kits. There's just one part missing from the kits that you are going to need from the for the soldering assignment. So that won't be there yet. It's the headers. If you, I don't know if you guys have read through the assignment yet, but uh, the headers are not ready. Everything else is ready. So you can solder everything else. Um, or you can wait until the headers are there. They'll be there very soon. Um, <coughs> we're working on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, does anyone have any questions about assignment 1.1? 1 .1? Yeah, what's up? Um, when are we going to find out uh, about the time for the work session? Like, do you think it'll be early afternoon? Um, I'm planning to be in the lab from 1 to 5. Um, but I'll send, I'll, I'll confirm that um, soon. <laughs> Yeah. Um, oh, speaking of assignment 1.1, 1 .1, um, has anyone had any troubles getting Eagle to work properly? Because I don't know how many people have like started the uh, software portion, but we know that Autodesk has been really weird with their software, like starting in August. So we haven't like looked through it ourselves and been 100% certain what is going on because it's really confusing with how Eagle, how to get Eagle. Um, if you guys, if you guys have successfully gotten Eagle to work, please let me know, because I still have no idea how that's how that's working. It's completely different than in previous years, um, and I already have an account, so they won't let me make a new one. Um, Question. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea how Piazza works. So what is that, this for? Because I, I have an account and I joined the class, but I don't know what. Like, okay. Just a billboard. Yeah, so we're going to be sending out announcements on Piazza. Uh, we'll send them out on Discord as well, but sometimes they'll be more long and detailed. That's also where we'll be posting all of our assignments and, uh, and our lectures and our recordings and everything, kind of a bunch of resources. You can also ask questions there. It's a great place to ask questions because it kind of keeps everything all in one place, and students can even respond to each other or we will respond um, to those. So You guys will use Piazza in the future for some other classes. where. Uh, we, we do use it a lot here at UCLA, so yeah. Okay, any other questions about assignment 1.1 1 .1 or 2.1 or logistics? Yeah, what's up? Yeah, are the lab hours like micro run specific or like do I just go to any lab? You can go to any lab hour you want, but Dominic and I will only be there in the lab hours that are listed on the website and on Piazza under the staff tab that are like the resources and staff. There will be information on where our lab hours are. It's also in the syllabus. Uh, we, it's, I think it's uh, Tuesday from 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. is the major micro mass block. Okay. Um, but I'm also there on Thursdays, and I'm there a lot of time, anyways. Um, but if you just need general help, like not like even if you need like help with Eagle, I'm sure there's there will be someone in there that will be able to help you. So it's worth coming in if you have like a, a, some spare time and want to figure stuff out. Um, there will be officers there to help. Yeah. Yep, the lab is open 10 to 6 every day. Uh, go on the IEEE website, has like list of which officers will be there. 
Um, but again, we're, we're, we're there often other times too, um, even if it's not listed. Okay, and then the uh, very one, last one thing. last announcement for you. I know we're boring you guys all with this logistical crap. Um, but lecture three, PID control, fancy, will be next week. Not next week. In two weeks, I you guys know, have. I don't know dates. I'm gonna... This is this is week six, right? Right now it's week four. The lecture is week okay. six. You guys have the week off next week. The, but yeah, the, you have next Tuesday off. But then the Tuesday after that, we've got our third lecture on PID control. Um, we'll send the location out ASAP, but similar yeah. situation to this. Yep, still TBD on the location, but that's when the time is, so we're good. All right, that's about it. Thank you guys for uh, sitting through that. And Thank if you guys. haven't been to the lab yet, we'll, we're going to be going at, to the lab after this, and we'll be showing where the kits are if you want to see that. Stick around if you want to see that. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Yep, as always.